How did you get labeled America's worst mom? Our nine-year-old son started asking me and my husband if we would let him find his own way home on the subway. So I did. I took him to a fancy schmancy store that I don't shop at, Bloomingdale's, and I left him in the handbag department. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast, hosted by Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race, and brought to you by Wild Health. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Get fully personalized health care based on your DNA, biometrics, and blood work with Wild Health, the official health care provider of Spartan. Go to wildhealth.com and use the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by the Exogen Ultrasound Bone Healing System. Exogen is a non-invasive treatment option that can help heal your broken bone. To learn more, visit exogen.com slash Spartan. Joe DeSena here, CEO and founder of Spartan and the Spartan Up podcast. Not too long ago, I had Johan Hari on. He wrote a book called Stolen Focus, told me about a bunch of people he interviewed all over the world, one of which I had to have on the show. She's here today, Lenore Skenazy. She wrote a book, Free Range Kids. She's been known throughout the world as a crazy mom. Is that, is uh, that the... I, I actually, I'm officially America's worst mom, but crazy has come up. Especially it rhymes with Skenazy. It's almost uh, inevitable. Well, America's worst mom meets America's worst dad, Joe DeSena. So I had to have you on the show. How did you get labeled America's worst mom? And then we'll ask you uh, about the worst dad appellation. So uh, years ago, our nine-year-old son started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he'd never been before here in New York City, where we live, and let him find his own way home on the subway. So I did. I took him to a fancy schmancy store that I don't shop at, Bloomingdale's, and I left him in the handbag department. He went downstairs where there is actually a subway station below Bloomingdale's. And apparently, here we are 14 years later, he took the subway, um, got out at 34th Street, Miracle Street, came across on the bus, came into our apartment, levitating with joy and pride and excitement and feeling like a grown up because he'd done this himself. And I was a newspaper columnist at the time, so I wrote a column, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, defending myself. And that's how I got the nickname, America's Worst Mom. Do you think it was the wrong thing to do? I mean, I know what I think, but but I'm, I, I'm curious, when you reflect back, would you do it again? Yeah. And a matter of fact, I had to do it again because after that, that was my reputation and I had to send him out all the time uh, lest I be a hypocrite. And the reason I did it and the reason I would do it again is because I know my son, I know my city, I know the statistics. And I really thought that um, taking my eyes off him was not a crime. Right. If you know that your kid is ready to do something and I'm not saying every kid is ready to ride the subway. And certainly if you haven't lived in New York City, I wouldn't throw you on the subway ever. Um, But he was, you know, I I was ready. He was ready. And his dad, who never got the name America's Worst Dad, uh, we were all ready for him to do it. And so, yes, I would do it again. You know, uh, everybody, every culture used to have a rite of passage. Right. We would we would all do tough things. Maybe it was kill a lion mm-hmm. or, you know, cross some some dangerous path. Um, basically, that was his rite of passage. It was his rite of passage. And in a way, it was mine. I mean, not everybody has to write about when their kid does something new or big. But at some point, you want to stop seeing your kid as an embryo or a bonsai tree and start seeing them growing and blossoming. And I think that's actually one of the joys, like maybe the main joy of parenting that has been stolen from this generation of parents because they're expected to always be with their kid lest anything go wrong. So they're always supposed to be watching, intervening, helping, assisting, and high-fiving when their kid is ready to go beyond that and start becoming the adult themselves. So um, rites of passage were a way not only for the kid to see who he was, but for the rest of the community to start recognizing this, this is not a child anymore, this is a young adult. But wouldn't it be a lot safer if we just kept our kids in the house? 
Like, it, isn't that a better way to just keep them <laughs> Thank in the you house? for like that it. softball. <laughs> right. <laughs> let, let me ask you, Joe, what do you think? Should we just keep them inside and, you know, let them watch TV and surf the web and do their homework and fill out their reading log and repeat? Is that what we well, want? Well, it's so... It's so much easier. I mean, now with devices, you could just literally, they could stay at home all the time. Forever. And then you know, you know yeah, forever. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're in the comfort, the comfort and safety of your own home. Listen, I am, um, I'm a parent. And so I am torn on a daily basis between wanting to be involved and knowing I shouldn't be involved between wanting to push them really hard and then, but also wanting to protect them. And, um, I got to smack myself often and say, <laughs> um, <laughs> and say, stop, like, like yeah. the kid needs to grow up. When you just mentioned, when you use that sentence about the joy of, of seeing a child like blossom and, and I love the reference to the bonsai tree, um, <laughs> I'm just having that happen. I'm just experiencing that right now where, where I'm seeing the kid like kind of do their own thing or like. I can't even say being pushed away. They're pull. They pull away. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um. Uh. I, I. They. They normally would. I mean, we're in a. We're in a doubly strange moment now, in that we're in a culture that has really decreased the kind of independence that kids normally had to the point where there was just a study done in Britain, but not here. But same idea that talked to parents and it asked them what age did they go outside and play on their own and walk to school, et cetera, and their age was the average of nine. And what age do you let your own kids do it? And it's 11. And, you know, considering we're talking about just 11 years of age range, taking an extra two years before you let your kid do something independently is a giant leap in distrust, you know, distrust of your neighbors, your community, um, and, and in your kids. It doesn't, doesn't feel like it, but the kid knows that you don't think that they're ready to go out yet. And so, um, and then you, then you add COVID on top of all of that, like a thick layer of cream trees, <laughs> frosting slash fog. And um, kids, I think, are built to want to be big, you know, like the Tom Hanks movie, big. But when you keep them down so much, and I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about a culture that keeps insisting that we watch over them every second and sometimes arrests you if you don't. It is the message that's sort of drifting into the kid is like immobility. Like, of course, you shouldn't go out and play on your own. Something terrible will happen. I um, I asked seventh graders once, um, you know, to, to come up with something new that they wanted to do. It's part of a project that Lecro does. And one kid's memorable answer, seventh graders are 11 or 12 years old. And one kid said he wanted to go to the movies with just his friends, but he was scared because there would be no one, and this was his quote, no one to watch over me. And that... I don't think his, um, was the way people felt throughout history. I don't think they were always expecting that there would be a minder whose job was to just watch over a kid when they did anything, certainly at 11 or 12 years old on their own, um, lest something terrible happen, especially going to a movie with your friends just doesn't seem, I'm trying to come up with a danger and I can't. Um, and yet he felt it was dangerous. So do kids want to push and go out. I think they're wired too, but I think there's been a lot of tinkering with the wiring thanks to a, a culture of fear. There's a lot of rogue popcorn out there that might come <laughs> after you. <laughs> it, it is the number I, one uh, way uh, people break their teeth. I learned, um, go to the hard way. <laughs> popcorn. So, popcorn so, bad. um, <laughs> wh when is the right age? Like what, what, forget about what you and I think, cause I think mm -hmm. we're extreme. We're not even extreme. We're, we're totally extreme. extreme. Compared, <laughs> <laughs> we're extreme compared to the norm today. But like, what? Yeah. What does the norm think is the right age? Thirty, thirty-five years old. Like when? <laughs> when are you allowed? <laughs> right. Somewhere, you know, thirty is a little old, but in the late twenties for sure. Um, so what you're asking is something that has a lot of different answers um, in terms of, and this is going to sound so radical, I'm sorry I actually opened my mouth just now, um, but in terms of child development, like what the, what the psychologists who study brain development say, by the age of five, which I have to say was the age I was walking to school, kids are capable of doing things on their own safely and successfully, you know, maybe not climbing a mountain, but walking a couple blocks to school and learning to look both ways and not get into a car with strangers, 
Um, but that is so far beyond what people think right now. I mean, look at if if parents aren't letting their kids out till 11, that's twice as twice as and plus in a year as old. So in terms of what is the norm that's allowed, the only gauge I give parents is to say, if you think your kids are as smart as you, and most of us do, um, what were you doing at the age your kid was? What were you doing at six, seven, eight, nine, ten? And if if your parents allowed you to go to the park or, you know, knock on a friend's door to play, or I, I don't know if that stuff is too far in the distant past that nobody remembers it. But if you do remember that kind of childhood, your kids are certainly as capable as you. It's just your job to teach them to look both ways before they cross the street. And you can talk to anyone. You can't go walk with anyone, stuff like that. It is, it is crazy. I, um, I, I spoke to Richard Branson. I spent some time Ooh, with him. I want to talk and, to him. And, <laughs> and, you know, I always want to know what is the secret to success for that individual and he attributes it, it ties right into this conversation, to his mom at a young age saying, hey, take this bicycle and, exactly. you know, ride home 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, figure it out. Yeah. He actually describes a 100-mile bike home to his house that he had to navigate and figure out at a young age. I, I remember once I had left my middle, child, my middle son and my youngest daughter off about three or four miles from home two or three years ago. And uh, my wife got home and said, oh, where, where's Charlie and Alex? I said, oh, they're walking home. What do you mean they're walking home? Well, I was, I was coming back from you know, Home Depot and I just decided to drop them off and told them to figure it out. But do they have a phone? No, they'll figure it out. And um, it's no big deal. It you know is what no mean? big we deal, weren't... but it sounds like a big deal now. I mean, that's what's so interesting, right? The first two pages of his autobiography are devoted to the times his mom let him um, go ride a bike to his uncle who was 50 miles away. And then when he came back with whatever, and she gave him, um, I guess she gave him a sandwich and an apple. And then if he wanted water, she figured he would find it along the way, which obviously he did. He's lived to this day. And he felt that it was not just the adventure and the excitement of going so far, um, it was that his mom trusted him. I mean, what we're telling our kids all the time when we're with them all the time and helping them and watching them is that we don't think that they can handle anything. And if you wonder what that's doing to kids, I, I would have you look at the rates of uh, depression and anxiety that have been going up for the last couple of generations. And, you know, anxiety is when you think that you can't think that something bad will happen. And if it does, you won't be able to handle it. And if you can't, it will hurt you forever, right? Anxiety is worrying that you can't handle anything. And when you aren't allowed to handle anything because you're not allowed out on your own, that, that builds up anxiety. And the antidote to that is seeing that the world is something that you can handle, seeing that you fell off your bike and it's still okay. You got lost and it's still okay. So I'd say the antidote for um, what ails kids today, what is, what is, literally hurting them along with, you know, the diabetes and the obesity is getting them out there so that they can realize that they can, that they are a person in, in full and not just their parents' pet. That's a mean way to put it. I, and I don't blame parents because it's a culture that is telling us that our kids are unconscious. When I look in the mirror and I, and I think about myself and I'm considered extreme, um, yeah, I do treat the kids somewhat like pets. <laughs> um, I think you, you, you could easily fall. Yeah, you could easily fall into that trap. I mean, it's so much fun being around them. Yeah. Um, you could be so much, so much more efficient in your day if you're guiding everything and doing everything. And, and, um, but you're doing a disservice for the child. Yeah. So in terms of that, so let's get back to whether I blame you or anybody for assisting and watching and schlepping their kids a lot. I don't. Because it has been baked into our culture. And the, the easiest way um, to show that that's the fact is that in, back in the day, Joe, when you went to school, the bell rang and it was arrival, right? Right? The arrival bell. And yep, then in yep. the afternoon, the bell was for dismissal, right? Really? Dismissal, right, yeah. dismissal, right? And now it's drop off and pick up, which to me shows that a, an adult has been baked into childhood, right? There's somebody dropping the kid off and there's somebody picking them up. So the kids become these FedEx packages that are, you know, shuffled from, from one place to another. And that's why I don't mean pet, really. I just mean um, somebody who can't be trusted to do something, um, to do anything, 
safely or successfully without an adult. And and then you have this culture like Parents Magazine once had this article about play dates. And one of the questions was, um, if my kid can stay home alone sometimes and, you know, does now because she's old enough to do that. But now she has a play date over. Can I still run to the dry cleaner while she has her friend over? And Parents Magazine, which is telling people how to parent, as the name would suggest, says, absolutely not. You must be there all the time. And they said, because what if there's... Um, they gave an example of once a kid had had a friend over and they were microwaving the macaroni and it got on them and it hurt because it was hot. Um, so there's the physical danger. And then they said, and also what if there's a squabble? You want to be able to jump in in case anyone's feelings get hurt. And so Parents Magazine is telling you that physically and emotionally, they can't handle even, you know, macaroni or, uh, or an argument to get about, you know, who gets to play in the dream house. So We've had our trust in our kids eroded by a society that keeps imagining dangers and exaggerating them to the point where if you take your eyes off your kids, you're considered irresponsible, even though, you know, the fact that you let your kids walk home those three or four miles the other day proved that, you know, I think you're being a responsible dad that way because you're showing them the world is yours, you can handle it. And, and I think that's great for kids. Well, that goes back to that question I asked earlier, like what age would the world, like when would it be okay at 20, 20, that's when the kids should learn because that doesn't make sense, right? Like that's why we have this issue. Yeah. So let me tell you about a study. We'll be right back to this episode, but first a quick word from our partner, Wild Health. Take control of your health with Wild Health. They're the official healthcare provider for Spartan. They use DNA, blood work, your lifestyle, and so much more so that you can get truly personalized healthcare. Healthcare focused on performance. You'll learn about optimal diet, about exercise, sleep routines, and how to prevent chronic disease. Sign up at wildhealth.com with the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. Spartans, you know, a broken bone can interrupt daily activities and even worse, keep you on the sidelines. Determining the best treatment option can be stressful. In just 20 minutes a day, Exogen helps jumpstart your natural bone healing process so you can get back to the race. Talk to your doctor to see if Exogen is right for you. To learn more, visit exogen.com slash Spartan. That's E-X-O-G-E-N dot com slash Spartan. Spartan. Okay, back to the interview. So let me tell you about a study that they want to do. There's these professors of psychology at um, Georgetown University, three of them. And one of them is from Russia. And she grew up, you know, one, you know, playing outside at a much younger age than kids do here. And what she and her colleagues are worried about is that American kids are getting their independence so late that um, the window on when they should be learning a little bit of street smarts, a little bit of risk assessment is closed by the time they are finally allowed out. And so it's not that they can't ever learn this stuff, but it's like learning French, you know, a little older. I mean, you'll, you'll always speak with a bad accent. It doesn't come that easily. It's not that you can't learn it, but instead of being fluid and at home, it's something a little scary and hard. And the experiment they did as just a, a pilot study was they asked college students in Canada and America and versus Turkey and Russia to um, evaluate some certain situations. You know, I can't remember what they were, but something that was the same across all these places, like, you know, walking downstairs in your dorm or whatever. And the the kids in, in uh, Turkey and Russia said that, they, that those things weren't dangerous. And the American kids said, oh, they are dangerous. And then in real life, she sent her students, who are college students, to, um, as part of an experiment, go to another part of the city on your own, take public transportation, talk to some strangers, and come back. And a great deal of the, the students, and I don't know if it was the majority or just a lot of them, took an Uber to a Starbucks, ordered a latte. That was their interaction. They, they said thank you to the barista, and I guess they gave their name. Um, and then they took an Uber home because the idea of being part of the world had already become too scary for them. And so when you wonder like, well, what is all this protection doing? It might be protecting them from inflated, scary dangers that you're imagining, but you're not protecting them psychologically from, um, you know, the anxiety of being worried about every interaction with the world. That doesn't sound like protection to me.
I'm with you. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning and thinking. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it is, it is what it is, right? There's going to be some tiny little sliver, some percentage of folks that things happen to. I mean, that's just the reality of living. Um, and we've got to, we've got to accept that because the alternative is, um, is a disaster. It's true. Um, the whole idea of zero risk is, first of all, unachievable. And secondly, um, it keeps discounting the risks in your home. You know, I don't think there's horrible risks in my home, but you could fall down the stairs, uh, right? You could choke on food. And when you, uh, you know, when you drive a kid somewhere instead of having them walk, there is the danger of a car accident. But we always somehow think that if you're with the child, the danger is zero. And if you're not with the child, the danger is, you know, somewhere between 97 and 100 percent. And that's, you know, that's sort of what these kids are dealing with now. When they're when the Georgetown people were studying risk assessment in young people, they were really inflating the dangers of everyday life. And I don't blame them because we have inflated them for them. And Parents Magazine told us to inflate them if you're a good parent. Worry that they're going to be hurt. Worry that they're going to be emotionally crippled because you weren't there to step in in an argument when the kid had with her friend. So it's, you know, sometimes I, I wonder, like, what is my mission here on Earth? <laughs> and I sort of get down to, like, pointing out the real world dangers of imaginary or inflated, grossly inflated dangers. What do, what do we do? What are three things parents could do? And I, I don't th I think it would be too risky for you to point out anything that puts uh, ch children or parents too close to the hot macaroni in the microwave. <laughs> All right. Macaroni is off the table, so to speak. Um, so you know that I run an organization called Let Grow. First, I started the free range kids movement, and then that matured into this nonprofit, Let Grow, where I really am trying to think about actions, not just changing people's minds about children's independence and the fact that they're growing anxious without it. I really want to make it easy for people to give their kids independence. So we have um, something called the, the Let Grow Independence Kit, which you can download. Everything we have is free. And it just gives you a list of ideas of things that your kids might want to look at and consider doing. Walk the dog, climb a tree, ride a bike, just to normalize the fact that somebody at a at a you know prestigious nonprofit said that these things are normal activities for a kid that you could consider doing. So there's that. But better than than doing this alone is trying to get a group of people to do the Let Grow project, which is the same idea. It's for schools, it's a homework assignment for you and your friends from you know your your reading group or your book group or your Spartan running group. Everybody downloads the Let Grow project. And it and once again, it says um, it the kid's job, the the homework assignment for the child is to do something on their own. And so they're showing it to you and you're going, OK, if everybody else is doing it, it's so much easier. And so, you know, those two kids are going to go get a dairy. I, I'm sorry, I say Dairy Queen. I know you're against sugar and fat and everything like that. Um, those two kids are going to go on a a uh, hundred mile run <laughs> together before dinner. And those two kids are going to climb the tallest tree in the Everglades. And I don't know if there are trees in the Everglades. Um, and those kids are going to do, it's just, you renormalize the idea of all the kids going out and doing something. So you're not the crazy parent letting the kids walk home three miles or four miles, or if you're Richard Branson's mom, uh, 50 miles. So the Let Grow Project is a great thing to suggest to your school, or if you are a teacher or administrator or a school psychologist, just look at it. It's, it's, it's so transformative because it gives parents what we were talking about at the beginning, that fun of seeing the kid go out, run the errand, come back with the milk, and everything was great, and now you, you see your kid through different eyes. So there's that. And then the other thing we suggest is giving kids time for free play because when you're just, you know, there's all sorts of social emotional learning and curriculum and stuff going on in schools. But if kids are playing, even to organize a game, of tech, tell me, Joe, what do you learn from just free play? You tell me. I, I would imagine I learn how to negotiate. I would imagine I learn how to deal with um, my ego being bruised. <laughs> I learn how to pick myself back up, um, how to deal with a, a group of kids and different personalities. Uh, all things that would I would need later in the workforce, but 
my challenge, my challenge is that now kids, I'm watching it happen in real time, are doing this on video games from the comfort and safety uh, of their own home away from the potential dangers even of the microwave and the, and the macaroni. They're not, they're Actually, not they're doing pretty it close to that danger. Right, right. If they were outside, they'd be further away and safer. So that's why the other thing that Let Grow um, suggests, and this is for schools or for community groups or for a church or for a YMCA, is to um, have a Let Grow Play Club. I'm sorry about the constant um, branding, but basically yeah. it's just this. It's set aside time, place for kids, multi-age, mixed-age kids, to just play. There's an adult there in case of a horrible emergency, stand in the corner with an EpiPen. But otherwise, the kids just have to figure out what to do, how to play it, who's on what team. Some kids are going to go off and play with chalk. Some kids are going to play with a ball. Some kids are going to, you know, do whatever, hopscotch. When they're doing that, the adult is not allowed to suggest a game, organize a game, solve a spat. A kid comes up to them and says, she had the ball, but it was my turn. And the teacher just says, thank you for letting me know. I'm sure you can solve that. And we've done studies where this, where like after a few weeks, the kids stop going to the adults all the time. And so it's, it's not exactly free play like you were talking about, but it is as close as you can come. I'm, I'm starting to call it like... Um, like a wildlife sanctuary, <laughs> you know, there's like a place that the elephants don't know that beyond the, the fence, you know, there's, there's, there's just cities. They still have this wonderful area where they can live sort of their old fashioned life and same with kids and, and there's no devices. So you don't have the phones or, or anything else to distract them and absorb them. And parents should love it because it's time when the kids aren't on their devices. And kids love it because there was a study done once. And I work with a man named Peter Gray, who I would also recommend for your podcast, Dr. Peter Gray, psychologist. He wrote a book called Free to Learn. Anyways, there was a study that he quotes often where kids were online and they were asked, um, would you rather be here online or playing outside with your friends? And about 80 something percent said playing outside. But you can't play outside if there's no other friends out there to play with or if everybody's in, you know, lacrosse club or soccer club or whatever. But if if there's a way that you know that you're going to be able to be with your friends outside or inside balls and cardboard boxes and maybe some junk like an old tire, the kids want to do that. And this is totally preliminary. Um but it's very hard to get people to recognize that play is not a stupid waste of time when they're not learning, um, that it's not just downtime. It's not just getting your yayas out. It's all the stuff you were talking about. It's negotiation, frustration, tolerance, how to make a friend, how to compromise and make something happen. So we had um, a PhD student studying a play club and preliminary results show that the kids who got into the play club, it was by lottery. The kids who got into it, identical to the kids who didn't get into it, are doing better their grades doing, are higher. They're doing better. Unbelievable. And they're probably fitter too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you're awesome. Uh, how can people find you? Pretty darn easy. You go to let grow, which is not let it grow. It's just L E T G R O W dot org. Um, if you look, if you forget everything else and you just remember America's worst mom, you'll find me online. Um, you could write to me, Lenore at Let Grow and start getting things going at your school or in your household. And, um, that's it. I mean, hopefully you'll put some little notes in somewhere, but, um, I'm so happy you found me. And I was so excited that Johan came and watched all these kids who had done the Let Grow project that, that blew him away because they were finally having a normal childhood. All the Let Grow children have a, a pass to a Spartan race or a Tough Mudder race anywhere in the world. So just let them oh. know that. We'd love I'll to have them. I'll put that on our there. site. Oh, my God. Yeah. How fantastic. Yeah. Wow. I'll put that on the site. That would be amazing. Yeah. And um, anybody that can't find you, I guess, just looks for the 10 or 11-year-old in New York City, the only child walking around or taking a subway <laughs> and just ask where Lenore is. Do you know someone who needs a little help staying motivated, staying informed, getting or staying mentally and physically resilient? We're here three days every week with a mix of content to help you stay strong. From mindset to nutrition and everything in between. Listen every Tuesday to hear Joe DeSena, Spartan Race founder and CEO. And the rest of the week, join us for DECA, endurance and classic episodes. See you next time. Maximize energy, optimize nutrition, and improve performance with Wild Health. Personalized precision healthcare built for Spartans.
you'll get a personalized health plan based on your DNA and biometrics and the support of a team of health experts. Sign up at wildhealth.com with the code SPARTAN10 to save 10%. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by the Exogen Ultrasound Bone Healing System. Exogen is a non-invasive treatment option that can help heal your broken bone. To learn more, visit exogen.com slash spartan.